staff meetings and a couple times a year they'll get together and they'll they'll talk about their employees they'll they'll actually rank the best on their crew and then they'll act uh, the older people or the other crew older crew members and then they'll rank the newer guys to see how they're doing mm -hmm. so all of them are paying attention they're taking notes they're watching what you're doing um that way they can keep kind of a little track record of how you're progressing as a new employee and i mean that goes a long way you make a good name for yourself you want to move to another department i mean they they've already started notes on you so yeah um, do all you can yeah and i mean i can go through so many examples here of, of you know the, the regular working hours are 7 to 3 30 at st p cooper when they're not working 10 hour days what happens when you get done at 2 30. well all right I mean, I'm going to take my truck. I'm going to go to the service center. I'm going to clean it off. And uh, if I'm done at three o'clock, clean it off. I might clean out the cab. All right. And then I'm going to, I'm going to take it over the fuel pump, make sure it's got full of fuel. And I'm going to ask my buddy on my line, you know, that's working on the crew with me. Hey man, you need to loan up anything for tomorrow or need any help with anything. It's kind of one of those okay. things. You know, I, I could go to the country store, mm -hmm. go behind it and drink a soda and eat some crackers. So you, you just got to keep, keep moving and you got during yeah not only are you under the watchful eye of your supervisor you're under the watchful eye of your crew also and if you get that crew camaraderie you get a fine-tuned crew of people that are going to be working with you guys your day will be so 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 much better okay my buddy at santee said every so often they try to rotate the crews around so you work with everybody you, they do. They do a once a year uh, rotation of crews. Uh, I'm not sure 100% of the timing on transmission. And what you'll do is, now I, this is the way I did it in my area. You had an overhead crew. I had two overhead crews, two underground crews, and three service crews. And what you try to do is you try to rotate those crews members around. First, you get different supervision. Then you get different crew members to work with. Now, when I say underground, through the course of the year, I, I asked my area coordinator, who is coordinating the jobs for me, I said, every so often, throw a pole change out in there. You know, get them off that underground for a little bit, make sure that they get some overhead work done. So, you know, it's kind of like the organization that you're going to go to. Sandy Cooper was more, and uh, Robbie, I know you can jump in on this too. Santa so Cooper was really wanted a well-rounded employee exactly. to where if they got up to that line technician B and that line technician A status and you sent them out to do something, they knew everything from setting a meter to changing out a 50-foot pole with a three-phase bank on it, triple circuit. Right. And that, that's, that's rather difficult. Yeah. So they wanted a real good, well-rounded employee. Some other organizations, if they're going to stick you into an underground crew, you're going to stay there and do underground, and that's it. Now, uh, Professor V and I have spoken about this before. Uh, we actually got into the processes where we were building substations. Okay. The line crews were building substations. We were doing transmission work. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's just the fact that you've got an employee that's just a lot more knowledgeable in an emergency situation can take care of things where you don't have to be waiting around for somebody else. Professor V, anything you'd like to add there? A well-rounded lineman goes a whole lot, you mm -hmm. know, further along the, the path than a, one that sticks to one task. I mean, mm -hmm. just that speaks volumes for the guy. Yeah, and it's gonna push you up the ladder quicker. I know we're kind of dwelling on this a little bit, but the subject has come up and I like the way Professor V, you know, relates it to the yard out there. Uh, how long did I work for Santa Cooper? Anybody remember? 37 and a half years. Now I have to admit, my progression from a line technician C to a line technician A was rather quick. I always got an XC's expectations uh, review on my, my reviews each year, so I was getting healthy raises. Uh, the minimum requirement for a line technician A to a supervisor was two years. In two years, I was a crew supervisor. 
and the minimum requirement for uh, a crew supervisor to be an area supervisor was two more years. So I was stellar all through those processes and I was getting my promotions right on time until I was the crew supervisor going to the area operations supervisor. So I applied and take a guess how many times I applied to be an area operations supervisor from a crew supervisor. All the other ones happened immediately. How long did, how many times do you think I applied for that position? Take a guess. Four. Seven. Seven times I applied for that position and seven, well, six times I got turned down. And I was thinking to myself, and this is the attitude uh, you guys need to take here is, it's not what's wrong with the company. It's what I need to do to myself to be a good candidate for that position. And that's the way you need to approach it with your supervisors and your crew members. If I'm not making the progress that I think I need to be making, it's not my fault. It's not their fault or it's not their, I don't know, you know, lack of whatever they're needing to do. It's what can I do to improve myself to be able to get that position. So what did I do? I went to my manager, Neil James, sat down with him after the sixth time. And I said, Neil, I said, I know I've worked hard. I think I'm a good candidate for the position. What can I do to improve myself to be a more eligible candidate? And when you approach it in that fashion, boy, you're letting the manager off the hook. Okay. It's not, Hey, why aren't you giving me the job? It's what can I do? His answer was Scott, there is an area in Santee Cooper that is really slow on their technical abilities. I need a good supervisor over in that area that of course knows line work, but has good technical skills to be able to bring these guys up to speed, to do timesheets, get material, do running records, do fleet records, all on a PC. What did I do? Oh, computer course. I went to college. Okay, never been to college. I'm 30 years old. Went to college, started college when I was 30, got a two year degree, associate's degree in computer technology, graduated from that. The next position came open, guess what? Got the job, okay? Continued my, continued my education right there and got the bachelor's degree in computer science. How do you think I got the job at Boyd Georgetown Tech? College. There you go, okay? Not only do you have background in the field and you've done well in it, you retired as an area operations supervisor, but you also have a four-year degree in computer science. So that just gives you an idea of the initiate, initiative and motivation you need to take to progress up the ladder. And I have to admit, as far as the industry is concerned, Professor V will attest to this every single time, there is no faster progression in any career that I have seen as far as pay and promotion is concerned. Right. Most organizations, you'll be a live technician A, making triple digits easily within four years easily. I've got a second year graduate that's working for Duke Energy up in Raleigh right now. He is making second year now $98,000 a year. Do you think he did that just because he's working? No. Motivation and initiative. Okay. Dwelled on that long enough. Anything else you'd like to add there, Professor V? I'm good. Okay, let's go. Back in the book, I'm on page 30, and we're going to talk uh, a little bit about the volt. We've talked about these, these things before. The volt is actually defined as electromotive force, or EMF. I don't like to use that term because we're going to be using EMF in another term here lately. I like to use, and you've heard me say it before, electric pressure. That is the pressure that gets uh, our current down a circuit. Uh, a volt is the amount of potential necessary to cause one coulomb to produce one joule of work. We're nearly not concerned with that. Just remember, as far as electrical pressure is concerned, and you're going to hear me say this a hundred times, when I raise my pressure voltage, what happens to my current? 
When you raise voltage, what happens to amperage, current? It goes down. It goes wow. down, okay? Inversely, if I lower my voltage, what happens to my current? It goes up. It goes up, remember that. That is, that is vitally important. All right, page 31, the ohm. An ohm is a measurement of resistance. Like I said out there in the world, guys, as far as ohms and resistance is, hurt, is concerned, it is the arch nemesis. It is the thing that you don't want and try to minimize 100% on your system. And I'll give you an example right here. Hold on one second. Images. Right, here's a great one. Let's, let's share this. All right, everybody see that image right there? Yes. Okay. What this is, is it's a uh, substation capacitor bank that you're looking at right here. And this is an infrared shot. So it's showing thermal properties of the uh, capacitor bank that's sitting here inside a substation. This can be anywhere that you have any kind of conductor or piece of equipment. You'll notice that in these conductors that are over here on the left-hand side, how much hotter they are in comparison to the rest of the, some of the other conductors that are up at the top, even some that are coming off the top of these uh, cells right here are hotter than others. Well, when I say hotter, what's being produced? Hotter, heat, okay? Heat's being produced. And heat requires electricity, voltage and amperage. It, it's an actual wattage. That's going to, it's, it's like your stove working, all right? You look down here at the bottom, the top of this one, that's a little bit hotter than the rest of the cells. You look at these down at the lower right-hand side, those are a little bit hotter than some of the other cells that are in this capacitor unit. What's causing the heat to happen? What did we just talk about? Resistance. Resistance. Resistance in ohms. A bad connection, an improperly tightened connection, a connection that wasn't cleaned before it was put in there. There are poor connections that are going on in this process. Where, who's paying for all of this heat that's being dissipated? The consumer. What was that, Paul? The consumer. So, we are. No. The power company? These guys, is, this is on the system. It, it hasn't reached your house yet. Oh. Yeah. Um, the so power company is who's paying for it. Yeah, there you go. These are losses that the power company is having to pay for. This is just one substation and one connection of hundreds of, I would say the millions of connections that are being made on a system within a company. And it's just due to resistance and improper uh, cleaning. Sometimes it's improper sizing of conductor, but improper cleaning and connections and it's creating resistance. All of that's being lost in heat energy. And heat energy is just pretty much going up in the air. Well, the generating station is making it and is paying, you know, is having to make something that's not being consumed by the customer. So they're having to pay for it. Our companies are very proactive of measuring how much they put out on the transmission and distribution system and comparing that to how much the customer is using. So there is a number out there that if my system, and I'll just throw some arbitrary numbers out there, that if my system is producing, generating and transmitting 1 million watts, and my consumers are only using 990,000 watts, where's the other 10,000 watts going? Losses, losses on a system. That's why, and there are companies that do this, there are some linemen that do this through the course of their career, especially in the substation field, that actually infrared substations and lines 
and they will identify the problem and maintenance must be performed to get rid of that resistance and clean up that heating. So that's resistance as far as the utility system is concerned. Uh, guys, bad systems with high resistance values that don't infrared and have a lot of losses, we're talking hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars lost per year just because of system losses. So we want to try to eliminate as much resistance as possible in our system. What, what does it boil down to as far as alignment is concerned? Uh, Professor V can jump in on this one too. Cleaning your conductor. Clean. Yep, wire brushing your conductor before you make a connection. Making your connections tight. I don't know how many times, and this is probably something I can bring up now. When you frame up a pole on the ground and you put your clevises on it, put a wrench to it. There, there's no need to, you know, put a pole up in the air with a set of clevises on it. And you haven't found, you haven't tightened up the nuts and bolts. Yeah. Uh, you tighten a dead end shoe down. You put your wire in the dead end shoe. Well, don't don't tighten two. Tighten all four and tighten them tight. Now you haven't got to wrench the guts out of it and break it. Right. But get it good and tight, and you'll know what that feeling is when you do that. It, it kind of irks me sometimes when I see something kind of a cross arm that's mounted on a pole and the through bolt's not tight. Tighten it up. Make sure it's done correct. Right. All right, next in the book, on page 33, the watt. Wattage is the measurement of the amount of power that is being used. So that's really at the consumer end. Now I've got wattage losses on my system, you've seen that. But wattage as far as uh, the customer is concerned is What's being used at the house? What's being used at Camp 4 for the saws to turn? What's being used at Ori Georgetown Technical College for the buildings to be cooled, all the lights to be on, and all the computers to run? That term is in wattage and wattage being used. And that's actually how the meter measures it. Wattage per kilowatt hour. I'd hate to know what the electric bill is at that place. Uh, you know, we, we've done it before. And, you know, we're just going to go ahead and do it right now. It, it's kind of, it's kind of cool what the college does. It really is kind of cool what businesses do. Hold on one more. This is a good opportunity to do this, to understand uh, volts, amps, and wattage in their process. Stand by. Uh, building 300, which is our usual building 300. I think we calculated right around, and we got meter readings, but we can't do that now. We calculated that's right around $3,000 a month. So here's the deal that's going on. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen, am I? Nope. This is gonna involve a little math, so. Okay, should have a paint screen that's up. Okay. Let me get my pen here handy. Why is this in the way? All right, pen, line size, this. Okay, so what's going on at the college? And it goes on for a lot of major businesses or in complexes or whatnot, is the primary voltage that goes into the college is 12,470, 7,200. So my phase to ground voltage is 7,200. My phase to phase voltage is 12,470. Any transformer that you go by in that college, if you look at it on the outside of it, it's got markings on it. And it'll all have those voltages, 12,470, 7.2. Uh, I have over here on the secondary side, now watch this closely or sometimes underneath it, 480277. All right, that's the voltage that's going into the college. And we'll use building 300 for example. Okay, so what's coming out of the wall socket inside a classroom? 120. 
Uh oh. What's happening here? That's going into the building. What's coming out of the wall socket? Any theories here? Uh, do they have like a? Mm, I really don't know. Never mind. Go ahead and say it. I mean, I, I think you probably have the right answer. Do they have a transformer kind of Excellent. deal? Maybe. Excellent. Inside building three hundred on each floor, they have a four eighty. Excuse me. Sorry about that. Hold on. They have a four eighty. To 120, 240 transformer on every single floor of, of building 300. All right, those transformers cost about six thousand dollars a piece. So we're looking at eighteen thousand dollars. That's inside the college, so the college had to provide these. All right. So. Is it, is it a different kind of transformer because it's. Mm -hmm. It's a dry type transformer, I and mean, we'll we really won't get into them deep. I'll show you a couple pictures of them, but it's one that's made for being inside of a, in, uh, a building, and it's made for the customer themselves. The power company has no responsibility whatsoever inside the building. If those right. belong to the school, now they're highly reliable. Transformers last a long time. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about wh what's going on here. Uh, say that the college, say going into the college is 1,000 amps at 480 volts. All right, this is just a simple right here, uh, what do you call it, ratio. What's the ratio of 480 to 240? Two to one. Two to one, right? So every one of these, I'm going to have two of these. So the college was being used inside building 300 is actually 2,000 watts. I mean, 2,000 amps. Because I'm able to convert, transform inside the college, the meter at the transformer is only registering what? One excuse me, 1,000 amps at 480 volts. Okay, the meter is only registering what? 1,000 amps, that's what makes the meter turn, amperage. Okay, the wattage that you're using inside the college is the consumption, amps turn a meter. How much am I actually using? 2,000. So I, I can guarantee it, if you're looking at a $6,000 a month bill, I mean, excuse me, $3,000 a month bill, without inside transformation, my 480 to 240 volt transformer inside, what would the bill be? Double, $6,000. So in six months, I can pay off these three transformers and for the rest of my lifetime, my bill will be cut in half just because I'm doing my own internal transformation. Remember, you raise the voltage, you lower the amperage. Right? You lower the voltage, the amperage raises. So it's really a, a bill, a money saver as far as the uh, school is concerned. Is it legal? Is it okay to do that? It has to be. Well, sure, sure. College in trouble. Say again, Paul? It has to be legal. Yeah, yeah. Now, that's not to say that I can go out there and it's, you know, the school is built for this. It's a huge complex. That doesn't mean that I can go out and tell the power company, well, I'm going to buy the my own 480 transformer for my house. Right, put it in my house somewhere in a basement or a separate room and tell the power company you need to install 480 at the pole out there just because I have it in my one house. That's not going to work. 
because the other customers feeding off that transformer still remain at 240. You can do it. It's going to cost you a substantial amount of money for the power company to take care of you, but really there's no cost savings there. As far as a big, big service business is concerned, it's all fine and dandy because it's huge. Uh, one last e example here of this part, and we'll, you know, we're really talking about what we're going into in the book as far as doing these types of measurements and whatnot, is, uh, let me get rid of this one. File, new, don't say. We've talked about this a little bit before in math. What are the legal, as far as ANSI, American National Safety Institute, how high or low can I go in voltage? Does anybody remember that percentage? 150%. No, no, no. As far as voltage is concerned. Oh, okay. Right. Sizing voltage. I can go plus or minus 5%. Okay. So my voltage can be 126 or 114. That's on the 120 side, that's high or low. And what's 5% of 240? Five times four is 12, that's 252. 252 and 12 minus 240 is what, 228? Those are the legal voltage uh, ranges I can go and still st stay within American national standards. I've got a transformer at, at my house that was uh, built in the 1960s and has the capability on it inside to raise and lower the voltage inside the transformer. So what do you think I have my voltage set at at that transformer? Just the regular 120, 240? Remember, if I raise voltage, I lower amperage, and if I lower amperage, my meter turns slower. <clears throat> I turned it up to 250. Is it still within the legal range? Mm -hmm. All right. What happened to my amperage? It went down. Okay. It's not much. All right. It went down. Does my meter turn slower at my house? Absolutely. All day long. It just gives you the general. It gives you the all-around idea that savings can be made and that raising voltage lowers amperage and lower voltage raises amperage. Okay. Okay. So my bill's lower by about, I think, what is it? 250 uh, minus 240 is 10. So we're looking at maybe a 0 0.4, 0 0.5% savings every month of my electric bill. Might not add up to much, but still. It's one month over year after year after year, it's going to add up. Okay. All right, back to the book. What time are we holding there, Professor B? 1020. 1020. Okay. So we've got down to the watt. All right. Uh, other measures of power. I'm on page 35. Uh, there are some other measures of power that you will need to know into the future for conversion purposes. Let me go back to the share here. As we're recording, we'll have this on recording too. Uh, screen two, share, file, new. And there's a chart down there at the bottom of the page uh, 30, 35. These, this is the one uh, that's most important. If you're going to be working with a good bit of motors out there in the uh, Lyman world, is one horsepower. equals what? 746 watts. Okay. Uh, let's see. Over there. Wow. Over there at Professor Granger's golf course, he's got a pump that's feeding that pond, uh, feeding the, coming out of the pond and water in his golf course. That's an eight horsepower motor. Okay. How many watts is it using when it's running? Mm -hmm. 
5,968 watts. 5,968 watts. Okay. Remember we talked about before that wattage loosely translated is how we can size a transformer, right? right. So what size transformer does he need to have out there just to power the pump? It's about 6,000 watts. Right. All right. There's no such thing as a 6,000 watt transformer pad mounted. The lowest thing that they have out there is a 25. So he's got a 25 kVA, 25,000 watts. Really oversized, but there's just nothing smaller in a pad mount version that they could have. At least you know you need to use the smallest one out there just for his pump. Now there's not much more out there. He's got the control box and that's about it, Robbie, right? Yeah, yeah he's got the control box that's controlling it. But that just goes to show you right there, if you're looking at a motor and the specifications on the nameplate of the motor, motor says it's 100 horsepower, 100 times 746 is 74,600, correct? Yeah, what size transformer are you gonna need? 75 kVA, just to power the motor. So that one is vitally important. Know that one horsepower equals 746 watts because we're gonna start with working with motors and three phase here and not too much of a long time. All right. Ohm's law comes up on page 37 and we start getting into Ohm's law and going through the book. Guys, we have done tons of Ohm's law in math. And then when we did the math, we compared it to ele electrical principles. And that's why I gave you the heads up, even though you might be getting stuff as far as transformers, amperages and voltages and wattages in ELW110, it actually carried through some of the processes in ELW111. Just be aware that when we're working in ELW111, you need to know what a pie chart is and be able to use those computations to substitute numbers. Again, and I'll stress, when questions come up, you need to have at least two numbers to calculate the third value. So if I'm looking for amperage, I've got to supply it with voltage and watts, at least. If I'm looking for watts, I've got to supply it with volts and amperage. Two of those numbers must be provided. Mr. Templeton's back. All right, the book then starts going through resistors. We are not electricians. Lyman do not work with resistors. Again, resistance is the arch nemesis of an electrical Lyman world. So you will not need to know all the banding of resistors, potentiometers, variable resistors. Resistors are mute in the electrical Lyman world. There will be no questions regarding resistors. I guarantee you that. All right. Take a look at the time here. In 26. Uh, we'll go ahead and take a break and we'll say, let's go ahead and just say 1040. We'll come back. Break time. See you back here at 1040. Here we go. All right, so what was Hurricane Sandy, 2012? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Yeah, 2012. And I'll try to condense this down the best that I can. So Hurricane uh, Sandy came in 2012 up there in New York, and it is obviously, if you haven't heard about it, don't know, it was very destructive. And uh, Sandy Cooper had already uh, sent all of our all of our contract crews up there to help with the Hurricane Sandy and helping restoration out there. And uh, about a week later, the uh, president of the uh, Ori Georgetown area, uh, my manager, and all the area operations supervisors were in a meeting about getting work completed because all of our contractors were gone. Well, during that meeting, the president got the phone call that they needed additional help up there 
in New York and they wanted to get uh, five crews, five St. Day Cooper crews to go up there and give assistance. And that totaled about 25 employees. So uh, the president, you know, relayed that along to us and uh, my manager was there and he said, well, let's go ahead and start getting, you know, crews together and get them prepared to go up there for Hurricane Sandy. Everybody kind of, the four operation supervisors and everybody kind of, you know, walked out of the room, we were done with our meeting and I stepped down to the manager's office and I said, uh, I want to go to New Jersey. I want to go up there to Hurricane Sandy. I kind of wanted to go on a volunteer basis. And he was, he was receptive to it. None of the op other operation supervisors really stepped into it. He was receptive to it, but, and I've got up on my screen, you'll see right here, we'll talk about this in just a moment. He said, Scott, you know, I'm pretty sure I won't be able to pay you overtime. I said, that's fine. Uh, I just want to be up there with, you know, the crews that are up there. And uh, he said, okay. So there's two, there's two kind of situations going on here. As, a, as far as alignment is concerned, your C, B, and A, and uh, other you know classification linemen, as far as they're concerned, they're, con they're considered what they call a non-exempt employee. And a non-exempt employee works on a per hour pay basis, plus they get overtime at time and a half. Now, watch, in some organizations, that, that can turn into double time. Depends on what the situation is. So for an example, if you're making $20 an hour, and you go into the overtime status, you, you'll be making $30 an hour. And in some cases, depending on the approval of it and the company, that $20 an hour will turn into 40. Now you start getting up in the supervisory level. <laughs> supervisors in this situation, they're going to get overtime also because they are directly supervising their crews through the storm. And they're actually the supervisors do work. I mean, they're in a bucket, they're doing work. Myself, though, I'm an exempt employee. So I'm making salary and no overtime. So regardless of how much time that I work, how many hours per week am I going to get paid for? 40 hours per week. And we were up there for three weeks. Uh, with, with companies that are concerned as far, you know, we're not doing this for free. And the company organization up there is Ohio Power and Light. So when everything's said and done, Santa Cooper is going to send Ohio Power and Light a bill for the work that they've done, and they're going to do it by classification. So I've got, uh, you know, ten line technician A's. I've got seven line technician B's. And I've got a seventeen eight tech, line tech. They're going to do all that billing based on their salary and the pay that they get. So they had to give me a title when I went up there and they gave me the title of safety director. And uh, that's pretty much what I did. I visited all the crews, of course, get a material, anything that they needed, went around a cruise and I was a safety director, but still, what am I getting paid for? 40 hours a week. All right, and I understood that. Now that does not mean that I went up there and didn't record my overtime. Their working hours during that situation were 16 hours per day, <coughs> including weekend, all right? Not including travel. We were based one hour away from New Jersey because of the destruction the hotels were all full, lived in tractor trailer, uh, trailer rigs for a, a little while. So actually with driving time, we were going 18 hours a day. Some people would swap and they'd sleep in their fleets. They'd swap drivers out as they went along. So I recorded my time, really, just in expectation of just getting the 40 hours per week. So let's do a little bit of math here. Uh, 18 hours per day, three weeks times 21. Let's see. I haven't got my phone close to me. Oh, let's go. 378. 378. All right. That's total. So I need to subtract out 
40 hours per week because those are regular hours. So what's 40 times three? 120. So overall, I work, let's see, eight, five, 258 hours of overtime. 120 regular, 258 overtime. All right, I'm getting paid for regular. That's all. Overtime, I'm really not expecting. Got back, I mean, we were all tired, squared away. I wasn't really overly concerned about, you know, what Neil had said. I was expecting to see in my paycheck uh, 120 hours of regular time. He calls me up about a week later and he says, Scott, we got approval to go ahead and pay you overtime. I said, well, fantastic. Now remember, we're working for Ohio Power and Light. So we are charging them for an A technician at their level, at their scale of pay. Here's the kicker, guys. Do you remember what my title was and what my responsibility was when I went up there? Safety director. Safety director. Well, I didn't know this. My boss didn't know that. If the president didn't know that. Guess how much the safety director for Ohio Power and Light makes? 60. He makes $163 an hour. So let's do a little bit of math here. 40 times 163. That's my regular time. What does that give me? 6,520. 6,520. Excuse me. All right, this is three weeks now. I'm sorry, I'm sh I should have done 120, right? 19,560. 19,560, because I worked 100 and worked three weeks up there. So 19,560 is my regular pay, three weeks. Okay, let's go back to the overtime. How many hours did I have? 258. 258. So 163 times 1.5. Anybody? 244. How much? 244. $244 an hour. How much overtime did I have? 258 times 244. 63081. 63081. Add 19, let's see, 1, 14, carry the 1, 6, 9 and 3 is 12, carry the 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 6 is 8. Guess how much money I made in a three-week period? Can I ask a question? Sure. What did you do with all that money? Say again? What did you do with all that money? Uh, first, I called up my HR department and claimed 15 dependents. <laughs> so it wouldn't get taxed so bad. Uh, the second thing is I paid off a lot of loans. <clears throat> paid off a car. In fact, I paid off a car, pay, paid off two cars. In, in the full scope of this, guys, it just goes to show, now this might not have happened. But for one, and to be honest with you, I wouldn't have been upset if it didn't happen. I mean, even the 19,560 in three week period is substantial. At the regular time, uh, they went ahead and decided to go ahead and give me the overtime at their safety director level. It just goes to show you, uh, if, if you put your foot forward and you might be putting your foot out and not an expectation of getting anything back, eventually things will pay off. $82,641 in three weeks. So you didn't go to the club or nothing? No, I don't go to the club, buddy. Oh. Sorry about that. Uh, I, take, I took it and did the best thing you're supposed to do with it. Save some of it, paid off loans with it. I couldn't be that responsible. 
But uh, that's a true story. And I know Professor V's been out there, and, and I know by fact, because of the way he's worked in his area, that he's done tons of things out there for his community, for uh, people that have called him up right on his cell phone when he was working for Duke. Hey, can you come over here and take care of this? That are really off, not in really the expectations of a regular day's lineman's work, but he did it anyway. Yes. One was for customer satisfaction, and eventually it pays off in the end. Right, V? Exactly. I mean, done things. People come up to you at church or in the store or something, and they say, hey, can you come by and look at so-and-so? And it might be a Saturday afternoon or something. You, you put a lot of your time into it. It, it is a customer-oriented, you know, job here, and you, you do all kind of things that you wouldn't be expected to do in other jobs. I mean, you may not be on the clock, but, you you know, you'll get it back one way or another. Mm -hmm. What comes around goes around. Uh, I, I kind of like this in the first class that I taught out there and I sat down with the students and we'll, we'll wrap it up with this and then head out to the field. Uh, I asked that first class, in your mind, how do you work this out? If I work hard, I'll get paid well, or if I get paid well, I'll work hard. Which one are you? It's surprising that you will find some people in your generation and probably some of my old generation that say, well, if you pay me good, I'll do a good job for you. Get that out of your mind. I mean, you're going to be starting it, even though it's pretty good, you're going to be starting at rock bottom. And the more you work, the more you learn, the more initiative and motivation you have will increase your pay substantially, but it won't happen if you just sit around and just kind of, go through the motions. There are plenty of jobs out there, and Professor V is well aware of this, that have seen line technician C's that have been line technician C's for 30 years. Yep. If you want to be that way, have at it. That's not in my attitude. Eventually, and this is my plan for everybody, I want you to be a supervisor. Yep. I want you to be the boss. You go to more college, I want you to be the manager. I wish I was the manager. I didn't have enough college behind me. I want you to take out there what is right for the getting. Okay, anything more that you'd like to add there, Professor V? I'm good, that was good last comments. Okay, uh, that's it for today as far as Zoom is concerned. We're gonna go out to the field. What I'm, well, I've got Professor V here so everybody can hear this. Professor V, what I will do is I will make a 10 question quiz. Okay. I'll transfer, uh, I will go ahead and, and log in for you and put it on yours. Yeah. Thank you. So if you want to go to the field straight away and get them started, I okay. might be a couple moments late. So yep. gentlemen, uh, this afternoon, and I'll text you when it's available, this afternoon there will be a 10-question quiz on what we've talked about thus far in ELW 111. It will be due at midnight tonight, and I'll put that in the text and on the news also. Any right. questions, sir? I just said right on, and guys, we get out on the field, let's... Um, Let's try to finish up that last row of poles and, and get some wire started. Any of you guys that haven't climbed yet or haven't done much, you need to get on it. Let's, let's get with the climbing. And one more statement I, I want to put out there. Guys, uh, Professor V and I, even though we've got tons of experience in the industry and you know, know what we're doing pretty well, we are open to ideas. And when I say improvise, overcome, and adapt, I think a couple of you saw that yesterday. I had two poles with guys on them that were ready to tie wire in. And in order for that to happen, the wire has to be up to sag. It has to be under tension. And if you think of a solution to be able to take care of something, that's just one example, to take care of something, run it by us, yep. make sure it's safe for you, but what I did is I took and I tensioned that wire to the pole that it wasn't up on yet so the, those guys could tie their wire in and come down. That's just, I, I love it when I see guys come to the process of, I want to work something out in my mind and it's going to get done. Yeah. You know, that, that, those are great things when it happens out there. You guys are more than welcome to bring us new ideas. Yeah. Uh, you've seen how double arms are constructed on a pole. I had two students come to me and say, 
well, why can't we just take both cross arms off at the same time, lower and raise them? I thought to myself, sounds like it's going to be pretty difficult. That's a lot of weight. We tried it. We got it done. But I give more weight to the guy that came up with the idea. It, it was rather difficult. So, I said, let's try it out. Let's see what happens. But I'm, I'm glad that that guy put his mind to it just to, to put, give the uh, incentive, initiative, and motivation to say, hmm, can I do this any easier if I take both arms off at the same time, take the center bolt out, lower both those arms at the same time, we're looking at about 100, 125 pounds, and then raise them back up and reinstall them? Rather difficult. Yep. But they thought of it. You guys need to put your minds in that mode also. All right, any questions? With that, gentlemen, we'll close, and we'll see you out at the field, 1230.